my friends, and welcome to Postscript. It's so nice to have you with us today. We've got an interview today with uh, our friend, Dr. David Martin. Hi, David. How are you, my friend? John, always good to see you, and you're looking great. Thank you for <laughs> having me on. Oh, well, you're looking great, too, so uh, <laughs> we can all uh, feel good about each other here today. Um, David, you're a... Uh, old friend of the Arlington Institute, and you've uh, uh, been associated with us on and off over the years, and, uh, and more lately, you've uh, built quite a reputation for yourself as being in the forefront of the defense against COVID and the COVID vaccine, but uh, where you really kind of uh, establish yourself relative to the Arlington Institute was anticipating uh, back in 2007 that in 2008, uh, or it was in December of 2007, as a matter of fact, as I remember, that the whole system was going to come, financial system was going to come apart. And we, you figured that out at least and talked about it at least here at the Arlington Institute about a year earlier than that. And so that got a, a great deal of play. Uh, and uh, you're going to be back with us on the 6th of April at Transition Talks. And we're going to go into the future again, uh, kind of by going to the past, I guess. So talk a little bit about yeah. that. Well, you know, if we go back to Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations in 1776, which happens to co-emerge in the public consciousness the same time that Madison and Jefferson and others were playing around with, with what the country was going to look like. George Mason was drafting the first draft of what became our declaration. You know, we, we actually had a story that was beginning to take shape, and it was directly as a result of the British Empire, which said that there is an aristocratic class the industrialist that was going to take over what used to be the realm of the monarchy. And in the wealth of nations, he put in place this idea that there were going to be those authorized to think, and then the vast masses that would be authorized to work. And he, he viewed labor as a natural resource, no different from the dirt that farmers tilled, no different from the or that came out of the mines, no different from the energy that came out of all kinds of, of lumber yards and whaling exercises and so forth. And not surprisingly, bankrolled by opium traders back then, um, you know, the drug dealing enterprises have never stopped. Um, mm. What happened was we built a world that was based on a consumption to extinction paradigm. And that means that we get stuff, we use it, and then we throw it away. And that goes for materials, that goes for energy, that goes for people, that goes for the way we treat our ecosystem. And that has been the realm that we've operated in for the last now 260 years. Mm. Um, and ironically, John, like many other systems, they were designed for purpose. They were fit for purpose. They actually did what they were intended to do. But like every other machine, the machine is broken. Right. And the machine is going to have a date certain extermination. Um, Martin Armstrong talks about Martin Armstrong talks about 2030 or 2032. I talk about 2028. But the good news is we're plus or minus four years. And the value of the conversation we're going to have is to look at the structural underpinnings of the system that we currently live in, and then examine what are the things we can learn from that system to do two fundamental things. One is, like Buckminster Fuller would suggest, use the tensegrity, use the tension that's in the system of collapse to generate energy for the transition, which is yep. actually quite exciting. And the second thing is to say, what about the old systems can we learn from so that we don't reproduce in new systems the failed elements right. of what led us down the path that we've been on for the last 260 years? So it's exciting. Yeah, uh, this is, David, this is all the new world and the new human that you're talking about. But in particular here, the new, the new world that's emerging. And we're all 
in the middle of this extraordinary kind of chaos and uncertainty with stuff going on all over us, around us that's irrational in very kind of fundamental uh, terms that are really hard to understand. And what you're talking about is the underlying kind of structure that we can co-opt almost exactly. to start to think about this emergent new world. And that is so important to all of us who are kind of swimming through the middle of all of this trash, uh, because it starts to give us a sense of the mechanisms and the leverage where we can start to be to build a new world. Yeah, if you think about a simple physics example, when we have a high frequency um, where we have this extremely chaotic, apparently frenetic activity, which is just changing every day. We have news up and down and up and down and up and down. We have craziness going like crazy. What we find is while the amplitude and frequency of crazy occurs, the magnitude of consequence is actually going down. That's that's the funny thing about the <clears throat> nature of transformation. And as our late mutual friend Napier Collins did in his scenario planning work, when he and we sat together on the Arlington board, one of the things that we need to look at is probabilities of outcomes. We need to look at what is the high likelihood High, high certainty outcomes versus what are the black swan outcomes that could take place. And we need to be thinking about this thing through a very measured and sober lens because the, the, the one thing that I find fascinating is that while people seem to think that we're in this chaotic and crazy time, if we take a step back and look at it as a life cycle, we're not in a crazy time. We're in a period of transition and transformation like a tree falling in the forest that is going to become the basis for the fungal connections, which are going to transmit that information to the rest of the forest. So now the tree is no longer standing erect like a tree, but it is now the basis upon which the mycelium network gets spread. We're exactly there. The tree is falling, and we're now starting to see these spores kind of spread around, and, and we can look at it and say, ah, oh, it's chaos. And the other way to look at it is say, no, it's information that's now spreading for what is going to be the transforming next. And what I love to do in our conversations, John, is make sure that we realize with a, with a sense of sobriety that the challenges we face are only problematic if we lose sight of the long arc of how yeah. transformation happens. And as soon as we can put our hands on the fact that this is not chaos, this is pre-order right. and, and, and moving out of this fear space that comes many times with chaos and going into a space where we go, oh, no, no, this is just the pre-order of what's next. Yeah, allows but you, us what to you're take doing the is building a go. framework. You're building exactly a contextual right. framework to make sense out of what's happening now and where we're going. And that's why this is important. It is. And it's, it's exciting because at the Arlington Institute events and at the transition talk specifically, what we find is that because of the nature of what you've curated in the community of the Arlington Institute, John, we have people who are transition makers and transition architects who come together. And one of the things I've said is, that the context that is set in my presentations and the presentations that you've hosted in Berkeley Springs has less to do with the substance of the talk and more to do with the fact that people who are actually at the vanguard of thinking and acting and doing come together and get to know each other and start collaborating because it's really as much the community that comes together as it is the substance of the conversations. And that is the reason why I am so excited to be back. I'm looking forward to an amazing event. And the fact is that this one is going to take on a strategy I've referred to roughly as the Armada of Arcs strategy. And what do I mean by Armada of Arcs? We have in our historical narratives this idea that we've got to survive. We've got to make sure we've got ourselves taken care of. We've got to make sure we get through the storm. And, you know, we have the metaphor from Noah and, you know, the younger driest flood narratives and all of these kinds of things. But what we don't have is we don't have a picture of what would happen if we built an armada of arcs. What if we had enough arcs 
for humanity? What if we had enough arcs for the transition not to be a apocalyptic ending, but a transformation of yeah. the social experience? And I'm enthusiastic about the fact that we are going to have the floods coming, but man, can we now imagine a world where we have the armada of arcs so that we all transition to the other side. Uh, I'm with you. I'm a, I'm an old sailor. I like the idea of a fleet <laughs> of a fleet, you know, that's <laughs> exactly right. It's the fleet. Of well, America. this is really going to be fun. And we're very much looking forward to having you with us on the 6th of April. Talk to us and bring us up to date a little bit about what's happening on the COVID front, if you will, because uh, well, you know that as well or better than anyone. We, we, we know that like anthrax in 2001 gave rise to the PrEP Act in 2005, where the injection manufacturers received their immunity shields from the toxins that they wanted to, to proliferate around the world. We know that the, the COVID narrative was all about making sure that we get ready for the World Health Organization treaty that's about to be ratified in the spring. Ironically, they're using exactly the same time sequence, about a four-year period from the terror crisis response to the, the world needs to adopt a more um, authoritarian and draconian system. And the great news is, I think people are starting to see through it, the best news is that we, after an exceptionally long and persistent um, effort, have now finally started seeing some attorneys general and some other elected officials who are now taking the message seriously. And I am now in conversations with prosecutors, which actually have, as their primary intent, holding accountable those who actually perpetrated the crimes that gave rise to COVID. So... Like anything else, John, you know, my view is that most wars are wars of attrition. It's not tactics. It's the last man standing more often than not. And our goal has been to continually keep the message front and center, to continually focus on the antitrust and on the racketeering and on the domestic terrorism crimes that were committed. And by doing that, we are actually starting to see progress. And I am excited about what's happening. My guess is that by April... There may be some things we can talk about, about real steps forward. So, you know, who knows? Maybe there's going to be a, a little COVID update at the at the event. So well, that, it, it's that would, exciting and good times. Well, that would be great. Uh, you know, what you've titled, titled your talk here is Back to the Future. And what you're trying to suggest is that there are some kind of principles some vectors that are in place from yes. long ago as you've just you just given as an example that are coloring and shaping uh the future that we're going to get one way or the other whether we are able to co-opt them or whether we just ride ride that way forward and so there are uh i i would guess uh, I, i'm just guessing but maybe finance and and uh, currency and money is in there. What do you what do you say to that? Yeah, well, listen, their fundamental architectures of civilization are that we have a couple things. We have the hierarchy of value and value exchange. Those are monetary systems, trade policies, um, the ways in which we access resources. All of those things are part of one of the three legs of the stool upon which society is built. There are the ways in which we organize ourselves into communities or into groups um, authorized and unauthorized to access or to participate or whatever else. And then we build technologies to reify those patterns and behaviors. And then obviously there's the education system, which gives rise to our social and cultural identities, the stories that we tell and the narratives that we build upon, which actually shape our capacity to think. And yeah. one of the things that I will be tearing apart in, in our conversation in Berkeley Springs are the three legs of that stool that holds up what we call civilization and saying, hold on a minute, if we can't imagine alternative outcomes, then the likelihood is very high that inertia will be the thing we use to advance the next emergence. However, if we do a thoughtful examination, if we consider the realities that we have been shaped into in terms of the way in which we think, the ontologies we use, 
the cosmologies that we embrace, if we can move into a more open dialogue about some of the underpinning assumptions, then the possibility exists that we can imagine a different outcome because we are imagining different structural elements. And so we're going to take those things and examine them and then talk about what happens when we alter our perspective on possibility yep. so that what happens is the emergent property of certainties, not probabilities, but certainties yeah. can emerge by simply changing the way we think and the way we view reality. No, no doubt about it. The whole idea of visualizing a future, exactly. being able to have a concrete kind of notion about where you're going is the basis of all, essentially all success. Uh, exactly. There are there are no entrepreneurs who don't have a really searing notion about where they're going. You know whether it's right or wrong or whether it's successful or not. It nevertheless animates and motivates everything that they do. And this is what we have to do writ large. And that's why this is so interesting and important to us. Uh, and uh, why we're very much looking forward to uh, this whole kind of movement into this new space. Now, talk to us just a little bit about what do you think about the implications of uh, AI, Chad GBT, and all those kinds yeah. of things? Because it seems like it just is an accelerator of this whole process. Well, remember that artificial and intelligence as a construct need to be examined in both of those two words. Right. One, one must examine the fact that intelligence was an invention that actually supplanted wisdom. Mm. Intelligence was actually something that was a construct developed for the industrial economy to celebrate shape, pattern recognition, and robotic behavior. So, First of all, let's get clear on the fact that intelligence as a construct itself is a problem. We once upon a time celebrated wisdom, which was the knowing that came through experiential yeah. process. Right. And, intelligence, intu and intuition. You exactly. Know. Intelligence was about turning the human pursuit into this automaton approach, nearly robotic approach. So, yep. so ironically, I have no fear of artificial intelligence, given the fact that intelligence was foolish and artificial foolishness is not anything to be afraid of. But what's more problematic about what we're talking about inside of the construct of artificial intelligence is we forget that the machine can only consume what the creators of the machine add to its inputs. And we once upon a time in the early days of computing talked about garbage in, garbage out. If you go onto Google as a reference point and suggest that a curated construct, remember Google's not a search engine, it's a <laughs> delivery engine. And it is yeah. a delivery engine of curated content. There are tons and tons and tons of wealths of information and data that never have made it onto Google. They've never been indexed. And so chat GPT and AI and all of these things are as dumb as the inputs that put them into yep. being. And given the fact that Google has never curated information, they have curated advertising drivel, which allows content to be disseminated for the purpose of revenue generation and advertising. So if you're afraid of chat GPT or AI, what you're actually really afraid of is the advertisements that used to be in newspapers. These things are not reality. And we need to come back to the fact that artificial intelligence is just accelerating the irrelevance that intelligence commissioned. Intelligence was about taking the human creativity, the human intuition and wisdom, and reducing it to geometric and formulaic redundancies. That's yeah. what intelligence was. So let's celebrate the AI collision course with reality that says that it will accelerate the irrelevance of human pursuits that have been irrelevant for the 260 mm -hmm. years I've been talking about and the reemergence of experiential wisdom, of intuition, of synthetic thought processes, right. yeah. of observational reality and assessment. Those are the things that will emerge out of the compost of the waste heap of the Googles of the world.
And I'm more than happy to watch this thing crash itself into its own demise, and AI will merely accelerate that. Remember well, yeah. that what technology will allow us to do, and in fact it does allow us to do, is augmented wisdom. What is augmented wisdom? A-W. What is that? Well, augmented wisdom is the ability to interact with technology to take the thought processes and your considered ontologies, your considered frameworks, and examine them through the light of multiple perspectives. And it turns out that by enhancing the aperture and the depth of perspective, we can find ourselves into augmented wisdom, which will in fact emerge a technologically integrated human technical experience which will in fact enrich our lives. But AI, it's the same flash in the pan yeah. that the advertiser was to the newspaper. Remember the minute we decided that advertisers are what sold newspapers, yeah. we lost the news. Yeah. No different. When chat GPT is, is, is the thing that's going to write your term paper, all you're going to get is the stuff that Google paid to curate and you are not going to get wisdom you're not going to get insight and you certainly are not going to get a better humanity well well i i agree with you and so does elon musk for that matter because uh, when people ask him about why all this woke stuff comes out of out of uh chat gpt he says well it comes from san francisco after all so you know that's right the, this is this is the problem conversely though if, you're, if your job is to kind of design and manifest and visualize a new world, it seems to me that, again, if you have the right database, which you don't right now, but if you had the right database, then the mechanism would provide you a, 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 a vector into the middle of yeah. your, into your space. Which is the reason why I'm advocating for the term augmented wisdom. You're exactly I right. I, I think that there are tons of perspectival enrichments that we can make when we take the thoughts we have and bounce them against the global construct of all other ideas. I think that's a beautiful right, thing. Right. You know, in my own company, John, when we built the MCAM system, we built that to build a meta mind map of every human ingenuity that has ever happened since 1786. And it turns out that emergent from that are thousands and thousands of ideas that no one would have ever possibly considered. Right. Because what we got to see was the expansion of the aperture of perspective. And by doing that, we were able to unveil concepts and ideas and technologies right. that no one had ever contemplated. We are on the verge of the augmented wisdom revolution, not the AI apocalypse. Well, I, I certainly find this uh, supportive and interesting. Uh, and, but I'll tell you in practical terms, here at the Arlington Institute, what we're interested in doing is building our own database yeah. that, is, that uh, starts to... Um, you know, include all of everything that's in my library, everything that is in some other very selected, selected large libraries that we're aware of, that you start to get these alternative perspectives, yep. these alternative ideas that are an integral part of the assessment and process that then allows you uh, to take advantage of the increase in the metabolism that being able to find a whole lot of things in a hurry, giving you alternatives. I mean, it's augmented wisdom only because the wisdom comes from the human kind of kind of assessing exactly. what's what's available exactly. and what this could do if you if we pointed it, if we uh, equip it in the right way and point it in the right direction is give us a machine that essentially we hijack uh, to, to uh, point us toward this new world and to run the whole thing in a far more efficient and faster way. No question. <laughs> That's it. And remember that the whole thing lives and dies on the quality of the breadth 
of that information curation. Yeah. The more we shrink our willingness to consider information, the more we lessen our willingness to consider alternative narratives and hypotheses, the dumber we get. Yeah. Well, and particularly in a time of a high rates of change, because then you, yeah. you're effectively kind of narrowing down <laughs> your perspective and you just talk, you end up talking to yourself uh, more or less. Uh, wow, this is uh, this is uh, really kind of fascinating. It'll be really fun to have you with us. What else you've been thinking about? Well, I'm looking forward to uh, once again inside of that Armada strategy, making sure that we have case examples of what works, not just ideas, um, like you just talked about at the Arlington Institute, coming up with solutions that are evidence and manifest of those new kinds of thinking. What we're doing is working very diligently on making sure alternatives are not theoretical, not conceptual, yeah. not the kinds of things that people play around from the marginal thought process of the armchair philosopher, but things that are tangible, things that you can touch and interact with, things that are actually producing. And so what I've been doing is focusing my time and my effort on making sure that we make manifest what alternative thought processes make possible rather than speaking of them in an abstract sense. And that's been the lifeblood of my activities yeah, now yeah. for quite a long time, and it continues to be. And once again, the exciting thing about what happens at the Arlington Institute meetings and at the transition talks specifically is that we're around those change agents who are equally motivated to be part of that manifesting process. And that's the reason why, by the way, people often make the decision, do I come or do I do it online or what have you? I'm not suggesting that the online is not a way to consume some of the information, but the qualitative nature of the experience in Berkeley Springs is made far richer by the participation of the people who gather in analog and start looking at yeah. how to manifest that transformation in a very physical, very tangible way. And that is the pursuit that I'm engaged in with every step of my days right now. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, well, and that's why we, we really appreciate it when you come this way. I mean, you're uh, certainly touching on a central point relative to who we are and what we're trying back here, because, you know, already, I think, uh, in the last two years, we have had a, had a dozen people that have moved from other places just to be here in yeah. this community. Yeah. And that uh, there's kind of no way you can get from from my point of view, there's no way you can get from here to there kind of on your own and by yourself. Yeah. Uh, that 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 this is a, a time when supply change and any number of other kind of things that we all depend upon are going to become uncertain. It, and um uh, that's where community comes in to where you can support each other, not only in, in, in tangible terms, but also intellectual and ideas Absolutely. and visualization and, and which all generates hope. And all and I would suggest that the kind of the path through the middle of all of this is uh, kind of in, illuminated by hope. Uh, that you see that there is a future out here in a new world and there are new ideas and new way of thinking and becoming that are just a part of this evolutionary jump. That's exactly right. And I think we, we have to realize that I've said in many circles, apocalyptic thinking is overrated and underperforms. Um, <laughs> history, history is full of, of, dates certain when ends were going to happen and you know and and the fact of the matter is um you know as as many times as we dig another archaeological dig as many times as we you know find another artifact you know right now the rate of publication of ideas where the title of the headline says something to the effect of this artifact makes us rethink everything we knew. Well, okay, great. <laughs> what that really is is an indictment of how much we know. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. The the fact of the matter is wh whether it's a a gear mechanism found at the bottom of the Mediterranean where we found out that the Greeks had ways to do 
you know, prognostication of eclipses and and we didn't know they had bronze gear mechanisms back in, you know, 150 BC, but now that one little artifact artifact has now made us go, we have to rethink everything. Right. You know, we we dig another hole in Turkey and we find out that there's another pre-Diluvian society that we never even knew about that had all kinds of traditions and cultures and art. And we go, that makes us rethink everything we know. Well, every time you hear that, what you're actually being told is apocalypses are overrated. They suck. It doesn't mean that asteroids might not land on your house. And for you, that's a bad day. But guess what? Something's going to keep going. Something's going to persist. And every time we've almost had the moment where we almost had everything erased, there has always been a something that didn't get erased, and that something gets to write its next chapter. And yeah. we are living in the transformation, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Well, so am I. Uh, and what you describe is uh, is essentially the the notion that if if we everything that we thought in the past to be true and built our whole framework and our paradigm around turns out not to be, you know, you find out that it isn't true. And that's uh, the most fundamental argument for permeability and openness. And, yeah, exactly. And uh, and that's what we got to do. And so that's why we're so happy that you're going to come and be with us. Well, Dr. Be a lot David of Martin. I'm looking forward to it. John, I yeah. always love being with you in Berkeley Springs, and I'm looking forward to the crowd that will assemble. It'll be a lot of fun. It will. 6th of uh, August, uh, April, 6th, 6th of, of April, April Saturday, going to get started at uh, the Cool Font Resort at uh, about uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and we're going to run all afternoon long, and it is going to be a really good time. And uh, we're looking, so we'll be grateful and happy to have uh, you and Kim with us again. So thanks so We're much. We're looking forward to it. Thanks, John.